A couple of guests joining us today, uh, and they're, they're speaking with us about uh, a couple of issues. Probably the one that is most prominent, though, and it's getting a lot of attention, because the House of Representatives in Washington has now moved this forward, and I believe it goes over to the Senate, is the U.S.-Canada-Mexico uh, agreement, or USMCA, I believe it's being called, uh, which is uh, designed to replace NAFTA. And uh, there are a lot of different inputs coming in on this. We were just talking with my guests about it, coming from a lot of different interest groups, and obviously... Uh, they represent a particular group of people in Idaho, in fact, a pretty good-sized number of them. Uh, we wanted to point out Joe Maloney is joining us, and he's the president of the AFL-CIO here in the state. Uh, we haven't seen each other since, I think, spring. Spring at the uh, Republican breakfast over in Jerome, yes. Yeah, we, we, we good good food, by the way. Yeah, not bad at all. <laughs> Fills a gut for sure. And uh, Jason Hudson. And Jason, you're with COPE is an acronym. It stands for what? Uh Council on Political Education, and and so that's your point is your 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 that's your outreach when you're dealing with people. Uh, both of you have a lot of I think experience talking to legislative leaders and various people, but you also have to talk to the public sometimes about these issues. Oh yeah, that's yeah. right, that's right. I do our both our government affairs and our uh, education with our own membership. Yeah, uh, wanted to point out to Bill Colley, and I'm handling the telephones, and we're at 29. It's seven minutes after nine o'clock on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. I'm of the impression uh, the Senate is likely to move forward on this bill, although who knows? I mean, these things, you can't always predict them. Uh, but there's a lot of questions, and I've been reading various different inputs I'm getting from people. Uh, you you got people who are, who are adamantly opposed to it or people who say it's just slightly better than NAFTA was. Uh, but then on the other hand, in Idaho, this is a, I was just mentioning off air, it's like a godsend for the agricultural community. Uh, how does it look for... Uh, for just the the, the, the the various job fronts throughout the state. So I'm going to defer most of uh, this to Jason because he's the one that knows it more than I do. I've I've got tits and bits and stuff like that for the most part, but uh, Jason's our political guy that knows it and inside. He's been on the phone calls and everything else with it. So Jason, go ahead. Yeah, well, uh, Bill, you know, as you mentioned, it's it's uh, the, the new USMCA, the the House just passed yesterday. It's not a perfect deal, um, but it's a pretty good starting point, and it's uh, it's a vast improvement over our old trade deals because, uh, you know, as you mentioned, Governor Brad Little put out a press release last week talking about some of the uh, statistics for the potential for this to really impact Idaho. And, you know, Canada is Idaho's number one export market. Um, you know, they purchased two... $926 million worth of goods. And Mexico is Idaho's number five export market. So, you know, between the two of them, they represent 25% of Idaho's total exports. So really, especially in the agricultural and the farming and ranching community, but also manufacturing, our tech sector, um, you know, these are really big markets for Idaho businesses and for Idaho products. And opening those up is... Uh, is going to be really important to keeping the economic growth that we're seeing right now going. We're not a big manufacturing state. There's some that exists, but I think sometimes people overlook the fact that a lot of unionized labor in Idaho is connected to that agricultural community. I mean, I've had people in here, oh, just in the last year who work at the sugar plant. They've, you know, they've come in to talk about various issues and things that they're working on. And obviously that's related to agricultural uh, you've got people who are working, you know, we think of dairy, we think about people who are milking cows, but all along that production and marketing route, there are people often who are unionized uh, workers. And uh, so they're going to be impacted then by any success that we have agriculturally. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, you know, the uh, the food processing is um, sector of our economy is really that bridge between manufacturing and our agricultural base. And we do. We have uh, we have a lot of members in this state that work in all different aspects of the food processing, from uh, potato processing, sugar beets, uh, cheese and dairy, um, all over the state. So there, that really is that bridge between those two different sectors, and it's going to be this is going to be a big deal for them. Now, a lot of us uh, who had some spare time last week on vacation got to look through some of this proposal. Uh, <laughs> it's not the it's not the, the, the most exciting reading that I've ever ever come across. Uh, but I hear people say, well, okay, it's, it's, it's slightly better than NAFTA because there were concerns that NAFTA had really proved to be that drain on American jobs that Ross Perot predicted you know, nearly 30 years ago. Uh, and then I read last week, too, that there's some concerns that, 
what we're going to be doing is we're going to be we're going to be strengthening the job market there too as well. Now I'm not opposed to that if it strengthens the job market here, but will it? it is there some concern? I, I know that in a lot of the manufacturing unions, uh, you know, the, the, the Mexicans were required to pay a, a, at least a living wage to people. And the hope was that it would increase employment here because people would decide to keep a lot of that work here because of the supply chain is a little closer. Uh, to me, that's this is I'm, I'm trying to put this into words that I understand because I didn't understand a lot of legalese in what I was reading. But am I right when I, I look at that and make those comments? Yeah, I, th I think you're exactly right. Um, strengthening labor standards on both sides of our borders helps American workers. It helps workers there, but it also helps workers here because exactly as you say, if, if those workers are able to secure better working conditions and a better deal for themselves, there's also going to be less incentive for employers to move jobs across the border. So we're going to keep stronger standards here, better economy, better jobs here. And when it comes to Canada, as I understand it, uh, Canada had been a little on the remiss side when it came to, they were dumping a lot of products, especially farm products, on this side of the, the border. And the idea was that we would strengthen parts of the agreement so that, that Canada would have to, um, I think cream was one of them I heard about. They were dumping things like cream here. But they won't be able to do that quite so easily any longer. Yeah, and that's, you know, I, I cannot claim to be an expert in international dairy markets, but I do know part of part of the agreement is to uh, eliminate class six and seven milk pricing. And I, I can't, I, I don't know exactly what the details are, but I do, my understanding is that really is going to help Idaho dairies be more competitive. When, when all of you here, the, the opponents often speak about this treaty, and I know there's a, there's a, there's a solid core people that always, they're going to be suspicious of any international agreement. Uh, and so... When, when you're talking with people about this, whether you're talking to membership or whether you're talking to legislators or just people on the street, uh, how, do you, how do you respond to that? Because some people feel we're giving away sovereignty whenever we have a deal like this. You know, Bill, I, I think that's a good question. But at the end of the day, um, anything that we can do to help Idaho workers get a better deal and grow our economy here... Um, you know, that, that's what we've got to advocate for because, you know, labor unions are by workers for workers. We are looking out, you know, for the good of our workers here and, and what helps them secure the best deal for a hard day's work. And, and this looks to be a step in that direction. And, you know, Joe, we probably should clarify too, not every union is under the umbrella of the AFL-CIO. I mean, most, I suppose. But not every union. So you know you're a conglomerate, but you're really only representing a portion of the labor movement. Yeah, in Idaho, we're you know there's there's quite a few that are underneath it, but there's a lot like the IEA is not underneath our umbrella at all. Um, there's other unions throughout the state that are not. So right. teachers and some of those people mm -hmm. are not involved. Right. You're right. you're much more the traditional we, we, unions. Well, we're we're you know I mean I don't know if I would say traditional, but I mean. We're the ones who've gone back for a long, long time, too. We've got a long history. I think the IEA has a long history, too, though, But I, and I don't know their history. But I know we work well together, and, and there's some great friends there with us. So, uh, But there's, they're just not, uh, you know, under the umbrella, per se, all the way. Yeah, across the state of Idaho, we represent uh, 25 different international unions, um, over 100 local unions here in Idaho, and about 15,000 workers across the state. Still that a pretty are under good our throw. umbrella. When, you know, when you've got less than two million people in the state, that's still a pretty good throw, you know. And, and they all show up to vote. I mean, that's one thing I, I recall growing up as a kid. Uh, but Joan knows my background in that. You know, I grew up in a union household, and and uh, come election day, uh, everyone went out and voted. I mean, and, and voted. You know, not always as a block, but at least they vote. Yeah, we we vote quite regularly. I mean, but that's one of the things where we've got Jason too. Jason's our our key point to keep that going to keep our members voting because there's so many that don't do it so we'll do registered voting and all that kind of stuff and that's his big key too is to get you know our members engaged and keep them engaged and keep them registered to vote and, and everything else like that now on the flip side uh, i brought this up off air but um uh, obviously this deal is big and it's, it's going to be talked about by a lot of people all around the country but also we've got uh, the two of you work very closely with state legislators and the word lobbyist sometimes gets a bad word, but sometimes <laughs> lobbyists are doing, you know, you're there for a reason. You're there to impress upon them a particular point of view. 
any big things on the horizon when it comes to state government in the because it's a, such a short window with just a few months session that they've got next year yeah again i mean we've got a few things on the table and and you know i've, I've brought jason because he's the the person that takes care of most of that stuff i mean I, i'll be down there every day as well helping out but uh he's the main uh, guy that i look to when it comes to lobbying um, that's why i hired him and so i let him do his job that's what he's there to do so do you, uh, do you find it's, an, it's it's it, it, is is it? I, I'm not going to believe it's easy work. No, it's. Uh, I mean, it's it's definitely uh, long hours and and a lot of work during the legislative session. But everybody that's down there is is working really hard. So um, you, go, you go like bill by bill, though, right? I mean, there's you know when when you're looking at these things and you're making your points, you, you're kind of looking at each bill and trying to figure out how it's going to impact membership. That's right. That's right. And, uh, you know, we have we have a couple of things that we're that we're working on this year. One of them, interestingly enough, tied back to uh, a news story that you were talking about earlier on your show um, with some tree trimmers up in Salmon, Idaho. Um, we're going to be doing some work this year to try and really make sure that we are protecting utility workers who are out there keeping the, the heat and the lights on for us because uh, that's really essential for making sure our communities are safe and healthy every day. Um, we're going to be doing some work this year to try and make sure that we don't have uh, trains uh, inadvertently blocking first responders' ability to respond to calls. Uh, we have some areas where uh, if you have a, a train stopped for too long, broken down across some surface crossings, it's going to make it real hard for a fire truck or an ambulance to get to where a call is if they need to. The side of town, we know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, we and, got about a minute before the break, but go ahead. Oh, and, uh, you know, one of the other things we're going to be working on this year is really making sure that we uh, level the playing field for responsible contractors who play by the rules and pay their bills um, to have a level playing field in bidding on uh, publicly funded work so that we are not using taxpayer dollars to pay people who are not paying their bills and have outstanding tax liens with the state. We got about uh, 30, 40 seconds before the break. Can you guys stick around for another five minutes afterwards? Absolutely. Sure. Happy nice. to do uh, so. We, we could potentially open the telephones too for a few minutes as well. Uh, quickly, though, I brought this up when you first the, you two first walked in, is that uh, a lot of your membership uh, this time of year is involved in so many other things. Uh, I, the, the folks who were here from the sugar plant, when they came in, they were involved in a charitable cause at the time. And so as we approach Christmas, a lot of times the locals, they're out there doing things in the community and it's not always seen. I mean, it's people out there, they're doing a lot of legwork behind the scenes. There's a lot. I mean, like just for example, the Magic Valley Central Labor Council down here in Twin Falls did that Toys for Tots and everything else like that. They raised, you know, I don't know how many toys there was. There's a whole bunch, big picture of it and everything else. We also do the hygiene kits for the schools in the area and everything else like that. The Magic Valley Central Labor does that. Uh, there's so many things throughout the state that we do that just isn't uh, seen sometimes, but uh, we do do a lot. Why well, don't take a short break? We've got more coming up. Thank you. And uh, we're talking with uh, AFL-CIO this morning and about a number of different issues, including USC. Uh, uh, help me out here, guys. USMC USMCA. Yeah. It sounds like a, like a music company. <laughs> yeah. It's at uh, 20 minutes after 9 o'clock. It's uh, 29 uh, Bill Colley with you, too, on Magic Valley this morning on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. Wanted to point out we've got a couple of guests joining us for a few more minutes from uh, AFL-CIO here in Idaho. And uh, Joe Maloney is the president. And uh, Jason Hudson is with, I guess, as you described it earlier, it's really more of the outreach effort to just try to communicate everything with public membership and legislat legislators. That's right. So give you kind of an idea of that. Uh, we've got a caller looking to join us. Uh, Bill Colley as well on News Radio 1310, KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. And I will point out, they know a heck of a lot more about what we're talking about than I do. Uh, we've got a caller. Caller, you're up next. You're on the air on KLIX. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I just wanted to ask uh, the gentleman about the UMESCA. It seems like UMESCA is being viewed by people in Idaho mostly just for the uh, effect it's going to have on the economy, but seems to me that's a little short-sighted because if you look at the whole picture that UMESCA is creating for our country, it's changing. It's going to change a lot of things. And I feel like the people in Congress voted for it yesterday. They have almost like a case of Nancy Politis because they're, let's pass it to see what's in it. And I know some of the things that are in it are really very dangerous for our country. 
And in so fact, can, the, can, the can Democrats you, can, can got you, their hands on it can, and can added you, some new Green Deal things to it. So why would we just say, well, it's going to be good for the economy and throw out the, the baby with the bathwater? I mean, I just feel like we're selling our birthright as a nation for mess of pottage. The mess of pottage is, oh, it's going to help our farmers. It's going to help this. Well, what about the rest of us? If can, we lose you, our sovereignty of our nation, what are we left with? Can you take a breath, though, and elaborate on what, what part of it would be dangerous? Well, there's a lot of things. In fact, the UNESCO contains 52% of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Well, what's that? What's well, setting up a supranational government for these, um, com- you know, the uh, countries contained in it? Um, I've been familiar with what the okay. intention with NAFTA was. It was setting up a, um, okay. even Kissinger said that this is setting up the architecture for a regional government. All right, well, there's a couple of points she's made. Go ahead. Okay. Um, well, yeah, and, and thanks for the call. And I will say, uh, you know, I don't think the USMCA is perfect. Uh, we're, we're definitely not there yet. I, uh, and I am not familiar with, uh, with some of the points that you're raising. But I, the important point, I think, from where, where we stand is that it is a significant improvement over where we're coming from, both from the original NAFTA that has gotten really outdated and even from the first version of the USMCA that came out last year, they have gone back to the drawing board and AFL-CIO President Rich Trumka and President Trump and everyone else who've worked together to get this deal done uh, have gone back to the drawing board and, and made improvements in the enforceability of labor standards, in rules of origin, in banning trade, enforced labor goods to set a new standard that we can go forward from uh, from here with. And so it's not perfect, and I'm sure there are some things that we're going to have to do to continue making it better, but I do think it's a, it's a very important step forward that is really going to help our farmers and our ranchers and our working people in this state. I want to thank the caller for chiming in. Uh, we, we, we should point out, too, you know, referencing that Trump could work closely with uh, the president trying to come up with something on this. We used to think all the time, uh, years ago, I guess the common belief was is that union labor was essentially just an auxiliary for one political party. We were talking off air, and of course I pointed out to the two of you that of my unionized parents, there was a split. <laughs> one was a Republican and the other was a Democrat. Uh, but in this day and age, uh, you know, what we saw happen in England and partly what's happening in places around this country, you're really seeing a realignment. And I don't know that the political party is so much is, is important any longer to labor as it used to be, you're just looking for people who are willing to work with you. Well, yeah, in Idaho, I mean, the thing is we have members on both sides of the fence. So it's important that we go to both sides of both events and figure out what's going on and make the best decision for our members mm-hmm. on both sides of this fence that's going to make their pensions healthier, their, their health care healthier, their wages healthier, everything healthier for our members. Um, so that's why it's important for us to get on both sides of the fence at all times and inform the members what's best for the members on both sides of the fence. I know that uh, when I was working in television, I had a reporter working in the newsroom one time, and she wanted a new contract in a raise, and we were trying to negotiate this individually with her, and the general manager didn't really want to you know, come up with something, a, a new deal, but he did admit to me one day, he said, everyone wants to make more money, um, and that's your job, is to, to try to help people out in that situation. That's why they, they, they have you in these positions, right? Well, not only that, but it's it's funny too because it, you know you know I always hear that well the union got this and the union got that, but under every contract it's man it's management and union, and they both have to come to that agreement on that wage, uh, and if one does or one doesn't, then you're in a different you know you're you do what you need to do on that kind of type of thing. So every contract that's going and every worker that's working under a contract now has been agreed upon by management and by the union. So it's like. You know, it, you're not holding them management. down, twisting their arms, making them say uncle. You know, I try to. I'm a big <laughs> fat guy, so I kind of every once in a while try to do that. But, uh, you know, uh, I, I try not to uh, do that too often, no. Well, and you said something important in there, Bill, um, that everybody who works for a living and counts on a paycheck wants to get the best deal for a hard day's work, secure mm-hmm. the best deal for themselves that they can. And that that really is the underlying premise of labor unions is – you know, workers coming together and exercising their constitutional right to to come together and work together to secure the best deal they can for a hard day's work. But there's a recognition, I think, too, really across the country 
Uh, and it, it's 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 even even more Republicans are I think aware of it any longer is what's happened to this country over the last twenty five to thirty years. We made some mistakes along the way when we let a lot of these jobs slip away overseas. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it we have, and and you know now we got to try to recover it and recoup it and see what we can do and build it. And you need you almost need you need some cooperators. It's not just got to be the unions themselves, but you need some cooperators in a lot of different works of life or walks of life to get on board and say, you know what, everybody's in this together. And that's, yeah, that's exactly right. And and I think we've really been doing a good job of that over the last couple of years here in Idaho is building, uh, building relationships and building broad coalition to get things done that matter for working people. It's not about one political party or the other. It's about doing the right thing for people who get up every morning and pull their boots on and go to work. We want to point out, we got about uh, 30 seconds to go. You've got a Facebook page, but if people want to learn more, uh, web, various places they could go. Yeah, they can go to Idaho AFL CIOs on our web, our web, and and our Facebook page, and and uh, you know, feel free to check that out and give us a shout sometime, and and uh, we look forward to answering any questions that you might have for us. Yeah, and during the legislative session, we might have to talk again. Hey, that'd be great. I'll bring Jason down because, like I said, he's he's the, he's the brains of it. I just twist the arms, you know. So I just go in there and twist the arms and take care of that stuff. So well, I want to thank Jason Hudson and Joe Maloney for dropping by today. Uh, from uh, Idaho's AFL CIO. It's 9 30. We have a short break. Bill Colley with you on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com.